Pull down. Thank you. Okay, we are back. Um, we are uh, at the Sync Up Conference here in New Orleans at the George and Joyce Ween Jazz and Heritage Center. We are on our third panel of the second weekend of the eighth year of the Sync Up Conference, and we are so privileged to have with us David Macias of 30 Tigers. I've been looking forward to meeting you for a very long time, and I'm really thrilled that you took the time to come. Thank you so um, much for being well, here. Well, it's an honor to be asked, and I'm uh, just thrilled to be here, so thanks for having well, me, Scott. Thank you. I wanted to set up our conversation with something that I think about all the time when I think about you and what you have accomplished and what you're doing and creating this model, which I consider to be completely revolutionary and which is why I asked you to be here. And so if you'd indulge me for one quick second. Tony? They're gonna up you to 15 per. Rehearsal in 10 minutes, guys. Uh, uh, Jeff, could you run downstairs and give me some cigarettes? Okay, boss. Hey. 15 per. You know, Ray, your contract with Atlantic is expiring in four months? Yeah. Yeah, well, I've got the contract with me. They're gonna double my royalties. Before we jump back in that pond, I thought I'd find out what else was out there. Hmm. I had a very productive chat with ABC Paramount yesterday. ABC, who told you to do that, huh? Now, you know, good and well, Atlantic is family, just like the Shaw Agency. Ray, my job is to get you the best deal possible. ABC's very interesting. No. How interesting? How about a $50,000 advance? Each year, for three years, you produce your own records. They'll deduct recording costs and give you 75%. Ahmet and Jerry are flying in tonight, so will you put them off until I can talk things out with ABC? Well, my mama said ain't nothing wrong with talking. Hey, enough of the formalities. Come on, let's go back into the office, Ray. I hope I can call you, Ray. I want you to be comfortable here. Because I'll tell you something, everything is going to be better at ABC. Moving from an indie label to a major means you're going to sell a lot more records, as well as attract much larger crowds, both white and Negro. Yeah, well, Mr. Clark, you know, I, I've been at Atlantic for so long. I just wanted to give those guys a chance, you know, to at least, uh, you know, match the offer. Mm-hmm. Oh, certainly, certainly. But, uh... I doubt they'll be able to. Remember, we're giving you a state-of-the-art deal here. Hey, well, you know, since I'm producing my own records, I was wondering if I could uh, own my masters, too. Well, Ray, we've, we've never done that before. No record company has. Well, I think I'm going to have to have it that way in order for me to leave the Atlantic Records. <laughs> I like the way uh, he's thinking there. Yes, me too. <laughs> that is, so that, of course, is uh, from the movie Ray, Ray Charles. Um, and I don't even know if that's a true story or, or if that's apocryphal. Uh, but no, no, that's true. So my favorite, certainly my favorite moment in cinematic history is when artist asks for the ownership of his own masters. And so, David, 30 Tigers is, yes, sir. is a, it's not a record label, or is it? Mm, I never know how to answer that. In, in a lot of respects, we are. We provide uh, the infrastructure, uh, you know, which is imp important, you know, when, you, when an artist is releasing an album and trying to organize elements of having a national conversation, you need infrastructure, you need uh, monetary resources, uh, you need general organization, and we provide that. And that way we're like a label Label also often infers ownership of intellectual property, of the recordings. That the label owns. That the label owns, but w we don't do that. Right, which is really, really intriguing. Um, so you work with lots and lots and lots of independent artists who release their own records, mm -hmm. and you come in as a distribution and marketing partner and allow the artists to maintain ownership of their own master recordings. Correct. 
and you distribute those records and help promote them and market them and get them out into the world. And we see artists like Aaron Watson coming in with a number one uh, Billboard album on the, on the Billboard country charts. We see Sturgill Simpson getting a Grammy nomination. Mm -hmm. We see all sorts, you know, Jason Isbell, lots, lots and lots of artists mm -hmm. who are scoring tremendous success. And, and so it, it feels like you are really breaking a lot of fresh ground here. I don't see a lot of other people jumping in and saying, oh, you know what, instead of having a label in the traditional way, I'm just gonna start a distribution company. Where did this come from? Well, <clears throat> you know, part of it was idealism. You know, part of it was, uh, and plus when we were starting the company, I mean, the company started, 30 Tigers started in 2001, and the, uh, we were a consultancy in the beginning. Um, and, um, you know, and the, the, our general idea, our raison d'etre, was to uh, help organize the demand creation. I started it with a former colleague of m mine who was a project manager at Arista, and I was always on the sales side. So my, my background, I worked for major labels, so I would go into, you know, <clears throat> Amarillo, Texas, and sell... Uh, Brooks and Dunn and Alan Jackson records to Walmart. You so know. you worked on the distri distributing side of yeah. labels? So you weren't A&R no. or ra radio promotion? Did you do that? No. So you were a sales guy. I was a sales I guy. I did not know that. Yep. Okay. That's my background. So, um, <clears throat> but you know, when you break the basic elements of, I mean, any, any kind of product launch down, there's the demand creation and then the, the satiation of the supply chain. So. Um, and, and so we tried to, um, you know, s start from that basic uh, thing because certainly to be able to get the music out to where it needs to be, you have to be able to have the trust of the people on the supply chain. So whether it's <clears throat> Walmart or whether it's iTunes or Spotify, uh, you know, they have to be able to trust what's going on. So you have to build the story of why it is that they should care about Aaron Watson or why they should care about Sturgill Simpson. And, uh, you know, so that's, it, it's all, it's all inter, inter, interwoven. So, so this is the website for 30 Tigers, and it says 30 Tigers is a marketing and distribution company that provides independent artists a way to bring their art to the marketplace while maintaining ownership of their recordings. That's mm -hmm. like a manifesto. It is. Was that the one you had at the beginning? Mm hmm Yeah, we've never... We've never uh, owned any masters, uh, you know, we just, I mean, honestly, uh, a, a lot of the, when we came up with the idea of what we were gonna do, to be honest, because I do a lot of looking around at other businesses, you know, um, you know, uh, uh, I guess he's, I don't know where Gino went, but at any rate, Gino Gennaro, who's Aaron Watson's manager, we're both uh, big business nerds and we love reading about other, you know, businesses and, and comparing notes and all that. <clears throat> and w somebody who was a big influence on me from the very beginning was Sam Walton. Um, I know, that seems weird. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm still trying to wrap my head around that, well, but go ahead. I mean, put this way, I'd say strictly within the context of, of margin, you know, and, you know, he built a, an empire on, on low margin and high volume. And, uh, and even though there's a, a real qualitative sense of, of what it is that you know, we try to do in the music that we take to market. Um, There's your volume right there. But, but you know, if, if, if somebody can earn more from selling 20,000 units or 50, if you can earn a living, if an art, if the creator can, can earn a living on those sales levels, and I think that increasingly because of the way that media goes right, is right now, media is very fragmented and you see a lot more artists that can sell 10, 20, 50,000 units where, where because they're, uh, the funnel used to be very narrow, you know, uh, back when, you know, when we were growing up. And now the funnel is impossibly wide. So, you know, you used to have artists selling, you know, I mean, at the high end, but, you know, the Michael Jackson thriller, the Fleetwood Mac rumors, those records would sell, you know, 25, 30 million copies. That just doesn't happen anymore. There, you know, we've really lost that sense of a national um, uh, sort of experience, uh, in, sort of the national cultural experience. So, um, but instead, you have artists that are able to cluster into these communities, and 
uh, and you have a lot more artists that are able to sell a certain amount of you know units and if they can actually make a living if you, if you, they can't ma earn a living creating then they're not really going to create or be able to put their whole energies into it the way that you know Gino was talking about with Aaron where they, you know it's just they're all in you know so um, so I feel like our business model in a lot of ways has a lot to do with so it's a, it's a reaction to the modern media landscape. And so did you also feel as if the then dominant structure of the traditional record company deal was essentially unfair? I don't think it's unfair. I mean, it's, I think, you know, anybody, as long as people are informed about the business decisions that they're entering into, um, you know, they can make rational choices. I mean, we also manage about 20 acts. And, <clears throat> you know, right now we have a band called Hippocampus uh, who, you know, played at South by these guys are all 19, 20 years old. Um, and they're, it's going to be, we think they're going to be a very big deal in the commercial alternative, uh, you know, world. And when you look at the, the, the risk of sort of take, undertaking that, enterprise, uh, you know, the, from a financial standpoint, sometimes the logical, you know, decision is to be, to be able to give up some revenue and control here in order to earn, you know, revenue uh, over here. And so, you know, sometimes th that can be the, the pragmatic decision. So I don't really look at it from a, a moral standpoint, but I look at it more like, you know, for those types of artists where, um, you know, a Jason Isbell can own his own work and get, I think, frankly, better service than he'd get from many labels because I think we, we are good marketers. We're very attuned to narrative um, that they can get a, a better job done for their records. They can own their masters. They can make a lot more money. Why wouldn't you come with us? So it's, I feel like it's just more that we build a more compelling experience for the artist as opposed to you know, anything else. And if we don't have that vision for what to do or, or that the team isn't in place, then they should make other choices. And those are, va those, those are valid choices. Well, it seems like you're providing an incredible value uh, and service, so, and, and the one that would be tremendously attractive to independent artists. You're allowing them, number one, to maintain ownership of their masters. Mm -hmm. You're providing them a higher rate of return than they would be seeing in a, in a traditional deal. Um, at, uh, you are able to get the records distributed and you've come up with a model where, at, where you're able to put out a large volume of, of recordings each year and, mm -hmm. and monetize them in a way where the, the margins are working for you. So it seems like it's you know, kind of the best of all possible mm -hmm. scenarios. So I, I would imagine that you must be inundated with artists that, that want to get you to, to put their records up because yeah. everybody's going to want a piece of that deal. So, yeah. But it also seems that a big part of your success is because there seems to be a very strong curatorial Definitely. instinct. So can you talk about how you, I mean, I'm sure every artist in this room would, would like you to be putting their records out. How do you decide who to, to well, go with and who not? I, I would say that they should want us to do it if we have a vision for how to take how to manage their their narrative and how to uh, you know take their their artistic expression to market. If we don't know how to ex how to explain it, if we don't know how to uh, build those connective threads by you know putting them together with the right PR people or or whatever, which is a lot of what we do, um, then they shouldn't want to be with us. And and so you know a lot of times I'll hear really great music that I just don't know. I don't, I don't, it's, it's not a judgment on the, on their music, but it's, it's a limitation in my vision for how to go out there. I feel, I mean, there's, you know, two words that we really orient the company around, you know, one is love and the other is service, you know, be loving, you know, to people, be loving to artists and, and that a lot of our contracts are there, you know, artists can largely come and go as they, as they choose and we don't confine artists into into deals because if the utility of our model uh, is you know if <clears throat> evaporates then we want people to be where they're best served and 
Um, but the other is service, and we take the, serv the, the you know, our call to service very seriously, you know, because we don't own their masters. We work for them. We, you know, we, you know, we are, you know, the industry, I think, sometimes gets it, you know, turned around, you know, where, where the industry sort of, I think, often thinks of themselves up here, and the artists are trying to, you know, it's, it's just, it's a weird you know, thing where the, the industry, I think, sometimes puts themselves above the artists and the creative expression. But in fact, once again, to go back to sort of, you know, r looking at other, other industries and other businesses, you think about companies like Apple or 3M, and those companies succeeded because there's an intensive product orientation. Well, what is the product here? You know, product is artistic expression. And so if, we're, if we do not bow down, and I'm, you know, I'm not trying to like kiss ass or anything, but I, you know, I mean it. If we don't sort of um, come into it with a service mindset on how do we, you know, how do we, um, you know, help this artist get their creative expression out into the world, where we just feel like we're looking at it wrong. You know, we place ourselves beneath the artist. We don't put ourselves above the artist. And from the curatorial standpoint, so you're saying that you have to be able to get it. You gotta, yeah. you gotta understand this music before you can get behind it and agree yeah. to go with that artist. And, and, and yeah, and and we'll put it this way. And I don't even know that I necessarily mean get get it. I mean, I'd say get it in terms of how do we take it to market? Because you know we we do curate, but we're we're all over the you know we we do all kinds of you know different types of music. Um, you know, we try to, t we tend to cluster in certain communities, but um, like in the Americana world, we're very strong and we have a lot of relationships and so we understand, you know, the importance of press, we understand which PR people are, you know, are the ones that, uh, you know, would, would be the, the best advocates, we understand, you know, we have great relationships with radio, you know, so, so we're, you know, really, you know, s strong in that market, but, you know, we're also, um, you know, currently investing in, uh, you know, a lot in, in, you know, in the commercial country industry, you know, and in, in, in being, uh, you know, kind of growing our thing there. Well, you know, like taking, you know, Aaron, you know, like Aaron Watson and Sturgill are very different human beings that express themselves very differently. There's, there's a, a core to who each of them are that we feel like we know how to express and how we can go out and help them succeed and um, you know but it's it's you know it, that has to be there though you know now I have th always thought about 30 Tigers as kind of exclusive to Americana music and I know. Uh, right and and so and this is this is very interesting because I mean when I talk about 30 Tigers I tell I say to people that you own Americana you guys totally dominate that space but most people don't realize that um, you know, in in the 2000s, you you uh, went back to school and got a degree in African studies, mm -hmm. and are interested in a very diverse array of music, and that you're involved in yeah. the Afro Afro punk yeah. festival uh, in Brooklyn. The, yeah, and a small piece of the Afro punk festival, which is the premier. Um, <clears throat> if it's if it's black and counterculture, it's it's at it's at the Afro punk festival, and and I think you're also <coughs> working with Stephen Marley. No, no, that, that didn't work out. Oh, I bummer. tried. Okay, but 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 still branching yeah. beyond. Uh, but, so so know, are you like but, putting out hip hop like records and band, other yeah, stuff? Yeah, well, we we <clears throat> just signed a a label deal with Sway. So uh, for those of you who don't know, Sway is the uh, he's the um, morning show host on Sirius XM's hip hop channel, and by far the most listened to and most influential uh, air personality in in hip hop and and. Um, he wanted to start a label and I just kept showing up and showing up and he's like, I'm sure thinking like, you know, who's this hairy dude who just keeps showing up? But, you know, but eventually, uh, <clears throat> you know, I think, uh, and, and, and honestly, I think <clears throat> a lot of it had to do with our investment involvement in Afropunk that gave him the comfort to feel like, okay, these guys actually will be good stewards for what it is that we're doing. And a lot of these relationships are new. And Afropunk, we're going to be putting records out through there. But it's <clears throat> important to me, uh, you know, personally to, you know, to be in, involved in, uh, in that world. And I also don't want to put limitations. I mean, my real passion is re-engineering 
the relationship between artists and the people that put their music out. That's my real passion. That's really what I wanted, you know, that's what I want to do. And so, uh, if, but I, but I owe it to, whether it's, you know, Afropunk and Sway and Van Hunt and Alice Smith who were putting their music out in the black music space, I owe it to them to make the investments, to have the people around who know what to do and, and also for, you know, me to, to be a student and go build those relationships and know how to be good, good stewards for their work to be a, you know, of service to them. Since you mentioned investment, can you talk a little bit about what kind of financial investments from your side of, as a distributor mm -hmm. and marketer that you need to make? Because when we say artists maintain ownership of their master and you're not signing anything away, it kind of sounds like you guys don't have any upfront costs. And no, that's not, well, that's not true. Yeah, we, we invest sometimes really heavily in, uh, you know, in the artists. I mean, you know, like, for instance, you know, we're, we're fortunate enough to work with Lucinda Williams. And, you know, Lu you know Lucinda is, she has, a, her recordings have a, 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 a sort of an asset value price, if you want to just get down to the, you know, to the dollars and cents. Um, ha, ha, they, ha, you know, have a, she has an asset value, you know, the, she can sell enough records that um, the cost to, or the expense of recording them, publicizing, manufacturing, doing all of that, um, the, the value of her recordings far exceeds the cost of, of doing that. So if I have to, uh, which we did, um, you know, front them the entire cost of doing, you know, uh, all of that. As long as I know that we can get our money back, you know, out of it, then there's no risk in it. So, is that common for a distributor to give an advance? Yeah, I think. Well, it's not uncommon, you know, okay. but, you know, but it's it's. I look at it as a pragmatic thing. If if we can, you know, I mean, given that I have the sales background that I have and the sales orientation that I have, sales is really the removal of all impediments to a yes. So it's sort of like, okay, ownership of the, of the intellectual property you create, creative control uh, over what your recordings and, and because we trust you as an artist, um, a financial uh, you know, model that will allow you to benefit you know, financially, um, the, as much of the upfront cost as we feel like we can bear without climbing too far off the, you know, out on the limb that it snaps off behind us. You know, if we can check all those boxes, then why wouldn't somebody want to do business with us, you know? And so, and I think that's, you know, really a lot of what the, you know, the rise of the company has, you know, has, has been behind because, you know, we do good work for our artists. We have succeeded with a lot of our artists and, you know, people like Jason Isbell and, you know, was kind enough. We're, we're going to, we just uh, are, are um, you know, doing a deal with an artist uh, that, um, you know, that is, you know, going to be coming out early next year. And one of the things that he told me that why he wanted to do business with us is that Sturgill told him that I was one of the most, you know, honest people that he'd ever run into in the music business. And so that kind of word of mouth among the artist community helps really drive things. And then, you know, and then they get in and we work our asses off and hopefully do, you know, good enough work and they succeed. And it doesn't always work, but, you know, if it doesn't work, then, um, you know, artists are free to go and sometimes we have to sort of sever those relationships ourselves because, you know, time being a resource, even if we're protected, we, prote we protect ourselves pretty well on the risk side of things. And sometimes we make mistakes and do climb out on the, on the limb too far and it snaps off behind us. But, you know, on the whole, we, uh, you know, we're, we're pretty careful with, with the risk that we take on. Um, the, the company started with you and one other person in a guest bedroom in your house. Mm -hmm. And now you've got a staff of 20 something? 27. 27 people. So there, there may, by the end of the year, there will actually be 30 tigers. So we're, we're excited about that, you know, so. <laughs> Boom. Uh, why did you decide to also get involved in artist management? Well, um, you know, that happened because, you know, honestly, there were artists that we loved and had a vision for but that, you know, but their circumstances w weren't such that they, we were going to be able to serve them through in the context of the, the distribution and marketing relationship. But we, I, you know, we just, 
wanted to work with them. And so... Um, you mean they, they were already signed to a deal? Well, I mean, well, in, initially, the, the, you know, the, the first uh, artist that I took on as a manager was... Um, actually, technically, the first was a band called BR549, and they were in a deal already. The, the, um, the second was uh, Elizabeth Cook, and for what it was that she wanted to accomplish, and I thought that you know we could accomplish, um, it was um, it was going to be difficult to um, for her, it was going to be difficult you know because she we she really thought that we you know and I thought that we might be able to get on country radio, and, uh, and that didn't wind up happening, but but. It, so I wanted to work with her, but it didn't seem like our system was probably financially going to be able to support what it is, but I just couldn't bear the thought of not working with her. So it was like, okay, well, let's do this, you know, so. And so how many management clients does 30 Tigers have now? About 20. And some pretty heavy hitters. Mm -hmm. do, do you also manage Lucinda? Are you her man? We don't manage no. Lucinda. So her, her husband, uh, Tom, who is an industry veteran, and he he's a smart dude, and and so that that's their family business. So he does a great job with her. But we manage, you know, some of the bigger acts: Jason Isbell, St. Paul and the Broken Bones, who just sold out two nights at Tipitina's, and I was out a little too late uh, and allowed myself to be overserved at Tipitina's. But uh, I'm hanging in there. But we manage them. Uh, I manage Patty Griffin. Uh, uh, and uh, we manage uh, uh, a couple other, uh, Trample by Turtles is a big band and, and you know, Hippocampus, and, uh, is, which is a big up and comer. And, and then, you know, we have a, a, a slate of, of developing acts. Uh, Kristen Diabel, who's a New Orleans uh, resident and, uh, and we just took on about two weeks ago um, just down the road, uh, Faux Filet uh, for management. So oh, we've got- Oh, very a, good. Yeah. So and so, are you also going to be? So, are, are you going to be distributing their records as well? Yeah. Well, in fact, that's how our relationship began, and we actually were throwing lines in the water with other potential managers for those guys. And then, as the company kind of grew, and I'm very passionate about that band, and you know, uh, and as you know, as the company, we didn't, I didn't sort of feel like we could had the bandwidth to take on management. But then we just brought a new uh, person on about about two months ago for management and I felt like okay now we have the bandwidth so now I feel like we could do this and not let you down and so and you know and they had to we had to talk about you know or do we you know or coalesce around a shared vision and all that stuff so it wasn't a, a fait accompli that we would you know do that the band you know we had to sell ourselves to the band and, and eventually did so th those are two Louisiana acts that you just mm -hmm. mentioned Kristen Diable and and Fofile Fofile mm -hmm. in in Lafayette and yep. Kristen originally from Baton Rouge but now living in New Orleans mm -hmm. um, was there I mean a any rhyme or reason for why you started all of a sudden signing Louisiana artists no. No, just that we just thought. I mean, you know, I, you know. I s actually I saw Kristen in England for the first time. She was playing at the Maverick Festival over there, and I saw her, and I thought she was just unbelievably great. It was just one of those things. Like Jonathan Levine was talking about seeing Sturgill, I was just like, you know, her songs are amazing. She's a great singer. She's got incredible presence. You know, beautiful young woman. It was just like, why? Wh you know, like you know, it's like th this. I feel like, you know. It's like, follow me, uh, let's go, let's do this, you know, and so. And I'm sure she said, where have you been all my life? Yeah, well, <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, at any rate, I, you know, I, I feel, you know, very lucky, and I feel like, we're, you know, she's going to have a really, uh, you know, bright career, and, you know, we're, you know, definitely in early days, but she's a hard worker, incredibly smart person, so, uh, and hugely talented. I feel super lucky to be working with her, but there's no sort of like Louisiana plan that just kind of worked out that way. But we also work with John Cleary. We're b b distributing him. Ricky Lee Jones, who's, in, re you know, moved to New Orleans not too long ago. We work with her, but it just, it just kind of worked out that way, you know, so. Great. Does anybody have any questions for, for David while we're here? Yes, Mark, go ahead. Hi, last week we had someone here from uh, Torrent uh, talking about their... Uh, BitTorrent. BitTorrent, so yes. Uh, some bundle sales, and was curious if you have worked with them yet or, um, or looking at uh, possibly releasing something through BitTorrent. Uh, probably not. I mean, I haven't spoken to anybody. I'm not 100% sure kind of what their, you know... 
Yeah, understandable. It was, I think it's probably new to some people, but uh, they have a model where uh, they bring some people in with some from free products, but it's also attached with purchase products and 90% of the revenue uh, goes to the, the label or the artist. Uh, and their big thing is, I think they have 100 million users a month. Uh, so they, they had 6 million downloads for, um, for Thomas York last year so uh it was and the other big thing that i think you would appreciate from what i gathered from that presentation is very idealist about supporting the artist uh as 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 well as possible and and putting the artist you know first uh, as much as you know well absolutely putting the artist first in every every possible way um y you know I, I, you know I'd, I'd have to study that a little bit more to have an informed enough opinion about it but you know generally uh, you know, when I hear BitTorrent, it doesn't evoke warm feelings, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, we're, you know, one of the things that we tr try to do is really, um, you know, you know pr to protect the idea that, that the artist creation has monetary value. And it sounds like perhaps they're coming up with, with you know, models that will um, help honor that, unlike sort of what's happened previously. But... Uh, you know, and, and sometimes, you know, th you know, that people can transition and, and uh, you know, to, to um, from uh, dubious beginnings to, you know, to solid business models. I mean, honestly, I feel like if the music industry had not, you know, kind of collectively had their head up their ass, Napster, you know, could have been a major force and, and, um, and a force for good. Um, but, you know, it, it, I think, um, you know, the, the industry um, oftentimes is... is too suspicious of you know of technology, but the technologists sometimes d are, you know, perhaps uh, you know. Well, sometimes they're just damn communists, you know. I'm kidding, really. But you know, they just you know, it's like you know, music ought to be out there and fr free and, and 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 all that, and that's that's you know, uh, you know. So I, and I'm sure it sounds like the BitTorrent people are not are are perhaps rethinking that. So I'll I'll check that out. That's why we did a panel with them, is because they're trying to transition from a strictly peer-to-peer -peer file sharing yeah. platform to one that actually is a is a monetizable platform. And they got a lot of press last year when Tom yeah. York decided to put out a record as a paid yeah. download. Um, yeah. Well, I, I and and uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know I dis and I do have to say you know I disagree. I mean, he's been very critical of streaming services, and I'm very uh, defensive about streaming services. I mean, I do feel like. Um, you know that the, the, the uh, r reaction ag against you know the streaming services. I mean, I think that there are some some nuanced and valuable criticisms of the streaming environment, but I think al almost none of them have to do with economic uh, reasons. At least none that I've I've felt like I've been able to to rebut. Uh, so, as a distributor, you're also a, you're a physical product distributor as well as a digital distributor. Yep. So you're getting uh, your artists out on Spotify and on iTunes and yeah. the, whatever <clears throat> Although, other platforms. you know, well, put it this way: because the artists own their master, and they they really are, you know, I guess technically their own labels. Um, you know, we do support the artist's decisions. Like Lucinda, for instance, didn't want her record up on Spotify. Um, we went and made the case that she ought to. You know, she said, respectfully, I, I, I hear you, but I don't want to do it. And so, um, so we respected her decision. So we, you know, it's, we put it in the artist's hands, but, you know, and most artists are, are um, you know, I, I think there's been very few that have. And when, when you talk about streaming services, are you talking about the subscription services and download services like iTunes and Spotify, or are you including in that the radio services like a Pandora? Well, it's a different, it's a different thing entirely. I mean, Pandora and, and the radio services are, those are non-interactive, right. and that those, are, those are analogous to a consumer's relationship with radio. And I think that the, you know, the, the, the um, compensation model because it isn't like, oh, well, you know, I want to hear Kristen Diavel, so, uh, and I want to hear this song, and I will go on Spotify and listen to it right now. Um, that's, that's, an, that's analogous to retail. And so um, the compensation models, I think, are and should be completely different, you know? And when, you know, people get upset about what Pandora, you know, pays, I'm like, well, you're getting paid more than you're getting paid for terrestrial radio, you know? And, uh, and and although you know certainly I think Pandora has not um, 
they've certainly fought really hard to pay a lot less, you know, and, oh, yeah. and, and I, I recognize that, so I'm not completely defending, uh, you know, Pandora, but, but they do, uh, you know, but I also don't think that when people conflate Pandora and Spotify in terms of uh, the royalties they pay, to me it's, it's like, you know, apples and, and oranges. Yeah, no, they're, they, as you explained very well, they're, they are completely different. But, but can you summarize the opposition to the, um, to the, to the Spotify's uh, that, that you encounter and why it is that, that you uh, take a different view? Well, um, bec well, I think, it be well, first of all, it's unsettling. I mean, everything that artists have ever experienced is on a transactional basis. It's, you know, I, I, you know, it's like I'm going to play a concert. Somebody is going to give a $20 bill to the person, you know, at the door. They're going to come in. They're going to see my concert. It's a one-on-one -on -one transactional thing. The purchase of music, same deal. You know, I want, you know, Jason Isbell's record. I'm going to download it from iTunes, I am going to give nine ninety nine, and you know, so it's a one-on-one -on -one transactional thing. And the, you know, the streaming service is really, uh, it's, it's more of a utility model. And so when you, uh, it, it's rather like the relationship with water, you know, and uh, you know, it would feel weird if all of a sudden you went home and, uh, and, and, and honestly, and I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, it feels, it feels like it's free, you know, and also I think it's hard to get your head around, you know, if you're an artist and you're thinking like, well, man, I, you know, if you download a single on iTunes, you know, it's I, you know, the wholesale price is 70 cents, but if you stream it on Spotify, it's six tenths, you know, six tenths of a cent. And it's like, man, that doesn't seem fair, but you have to, you know, sort of reconcile the acquisition thing that's a one-time payment as opposed to, you know, every time you consume that, you know, through a streaming service that that's another six-tenths of a cent. And there's certain, you know, uh, you know, you, 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 you know, I'm, you know, it's like Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, you know, they're, they've had their music streamed over a billion times on Spotify. You, just like you can't get your head around six-tenths of a cent, the scale of what's possible and how people consume there you can't get your head around a billion you know uh, it, you know on the uh, on the other end of thing and uh, you know on the other side of things and and so to me the ultimate test on the viability of that as a model you know you just have to look at markets where it's scaled and you look at a market like Sweden where now 80% it's mature enough in Sweden where now 80% of all revenues come from Spotify that is how music is consumed over there so if streaming was uh, not viable for uh, for the, for an entire ecosystem. It would show up in Sweden, but just the opposite has happened. Revenues have continued to climb. You know they've climbed, you know precipitously since 2008. Now you know, granted, piracy was in incredibly bad in Sweden, so a lot of that rise has to do with um, you know with with uh, people finding something that's more compelling than stealing files, you know, it's just easier to, it's like, well, this is, you know, legal, and I'll like to pay my 9.99 kroner to, you know, to be able to get access to whatever I want whenever I want it. It's more compelling than piracy, to, to many it is at, at any rate. So, but revenues have climbed, and so, so if it were bad for an ecosystem, you, you would, you would, it would, that just wouldn't be the case. But when you're making the argument to Lucinda Williams that she should be on Spotify, is the argument an economic one that, yes, this will generate revenue for you and, and this is a viable business proposition? Or is the argument, look, it may not make any money for you, but the whole world no. is on Spotify and I, therefore you <laughs> should be there too? Well, I, I never make the argument that it won't make money for you because that's just not true. I mean, you know, it's, it, it does make money. I, I, I reject the argument like, well, you know, you get on there and it'll be exposure and people will buy your record. It's like, no. Streaming is a viable economic model in and of itself, period. My other argument about it is not only is it viable economically or financially, but it's also a customer service issue. You know, it's like people are like, oh, should we even make CDs anymore? It's like, look, yes, because if your consumer wants to consume your music that way and you don't make it available to them in that way, then you're not employing good customer service. And there are some people that just can't get their head around listening to music on something other than a CD. Yeah, exactly. Especially, you know, especially, art, you know, uh, you know uh, consumers that are a little bit older. I mean, you know, Lucinda, whose audience is, and she certainly has a lot of, you know, young and, and, and hip fans, and Pitchfork just wrote a great, you know, piece about her, but 
you know, a lot of her fans are older, and so, you know, with her, our, our, the physical units are, make up 70 to 75 percent of her, of her consumption. As a company, overall, 30 Tigers, do you, do you have a percentage of how much of your revenue comes from physical product and how much from digital? It's about, right now, we're at about 40 percent CDs, 55 percent digital, and about 5 percent vinyl. Wow. So the, so the digital makes up the majority of mm -hmm. your revenue? Yeah. Is that surprising to you? No. No. So why do people say that there's no money in digital? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I mean, honestly, it's, a, you know, I mean, we have artists that have I mean, earned... They talk about, you know, Pharrell getting $3,500 for 10 billion we'll plays and whatnot. Well, and, and first of all, you know, the, 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 but I, those things are always short on specifics. It's like, well, are, you, we, are we talking about Pandora? Because it, mi it might be that, you know, that that was, you know, uh, an, a, a non-interactive service, right. in which case... Once again, well, that thirty-five hundred dollars you got paid by a non-interactive service is more than you got paid by terrestrial radio. Of course, you know he wrote Happy, so he's getting, you know, publishing revenues or his publishing company is. But a lot of times, when those numbers show up on the accounting statement, it's it's uh, uh, the other question I always want to ask is what kind of a deal are you in? Because it may show up on your statements you're only getting that, but I guarantee your record label is getting that, and you know, and our artists you know, keep the vast majority of the money. I mean, basically the breakdown of our deal is that, you know, the artist, we, our distributor keeps about 15%, we keep about 10%, and the artist keeps 75%, much like Ray Charles. And they get, get to own their, see, see, there's nothing revolutionary. It's all Ray Charles, I guess. I, I didn't realize <laughs> it, but, um, but all the expenses come out of the artist 75%. Our 10% our is sacred. You know, we, that's how we earn our, are living and I pay for those 30, 27 tigers soon to be 30. Um, um, so, um, but, so, you know, so the artists can, once they get into these streaming services and they actually look at their statements, I mean, we have several acts, not several, uh, you know, but I'd say probably maybe 10 to a dozen acts that have now earned, you know, over $100,000 from Spotify. So, and the other thing is, Spotify is still only about 10% of the market here. So, you know, people are like, oh, well, you know, if they're only earning 100,000, it's like, well, that's 10% of their sales. They're still selling a lot of CDs and vinyl and downloads on iTunes. And as the market transitions, then, you know, as long as the m model is a fair model, then, you know, it's gonna all be good, you know? And the Spotify thing is so confusing because they are paying what's essentially a bundled royalty that encompasses both pub public performance royalty and um, uh, are basically sales revenues. And it, it, so if the artist owns their own master, then they are gonna see a yeah. much more healthy chunk of that revenue than they yeah. would if they're signed to a traditional label deal. Correct. Awesome. Um, any other questions? All right. Here we have Reed Wick from the Recording Academy. Hey, I just wanted to know, um, you know, for a long time the catchphrase was how do you compete with free, and you mentioned earlier about your, your physical sales. I wonder how much, uh, we just did a panel on vinyl, the resurgence of vinyl. I wonder how much uh, 30 Tigers is involved with, you know, the packaging, talking to the audience, you know, partnering with the audi artist on developing uh, additional things that can be thrown into the packaging. I mean, I'm, I'm a big fan of oh you know, liner yeah. notes and things like that? Yeah, lots. I mean, you know, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll give, you know, I always say, you know, we'll, we, you know, to artists, we'll give you our best advice and our hardest work, but ultimately the decision is, is yours, you know, because they own it. But, you know, we do have a lot of experience and issues about packaging and things like that. And, you know, and, and a lot of, you know, what we'll give advice on is, you know, we're a very narrative driven company. You know, we, we you know, there if, I mean, you know, you heard the, the for those of you who are in for the Sturgill panel, I mean, that was an artist that had a point of view and something to say, and the imagery and the packaging and all of that reinforces them. Now, though, we didn't need to give them any advice because they have a very clear vision of w what they're going to do. But sometimes, it, you know, we can offer helpful advice and suggestions, you know, when it comes to things. And I did want to say one thing Please. about Sturgill um, that did that didn't necessarily, I, I think, get voiced. Um, is that you know when you talk to Sturgill because you know he does talk about. Um, you know, illicit drugs and, and things like that. But the, the point of view that he has is a very, it's a very spiritual, metaphysical point of view. That's a deep motherfucker right there. He is a deep guy. And so, so there's, 
you know, the story of Sturgill Simpson, you know, and why I think journalists have really gravitated to him has to do more with, um, you, you know, with, with there being an expression of, of, of sort of a qualitative expression of what's happening there. And, and, and obviously, you know, they talked about the live performance and all that stuff, but, uh, you know, often, you know, we tend to gravitate towards artists. It's like, well, you know, sort of one of the divides in my head is like, okay, well, what is it that you want to say, you know? So, and, and sometimes we have, you know, that we, we work with artists that are probably more driven by just having hits and earning money. And so it's sort of like, do you want to say something or do you want to be somebody? And if you're a, do you want to say something artist, then we try to really sort of buckle down on the narrative and, and you know, get, dig into those issues. And certainly imagery that, that, that um, doesn't support the overall narrative is not helpful, you know, so. I, I agree that he is very deep, and, yeah. and that is probably one of the reasons what, when people do find out about what influenced his lyrical choices mm -hmm. and the things that he reads and, and w yeah. the, the, the psychology and the, uh, and, and the, the learned approach to, mm -hmm. to what, it's, it's not like he just decided that he wanted to write about that stuff instead of cars. Yeah. It's because he really has something yeah. that he believes in. Right, yeah, and songs like Just Let Go, or let's, that's some Buddhism right there, man. That's uh, that's some that's some good, um, you know. There, you know, he's a deep. So I mean, I just and I feel like in which is why I wonder whether yeah. he wants to transcend country altogether. Uh, yeah. Well, he'll. Yeah. I mean, I don't think he wants to be confined by it. I'll t uh, I, I feel like I, I can say that. You know. Um, so what he really wants is to be Taylor Swift. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. No, I don't think so. Though I'm sure he doesn't bear her any ill will. So. Awesome. Um, anybody else? Any other questions? All right, we have one here. Do Do you have to choose between like the message and, and wanting to be somebody? Is there some type of center point? Uh, um, I, I mean, honestly, it, it's not. I mean, it's probably not quite as. A div I mean, everybody wants to be, you know, to succeed and to be able to to do it. I mean, there's no, you know, I don't, you know, I don't sort of measure it on the, on that thing but it just but if you're going to be if you're going to expect press to be a major component part of what you're doing then you know the issues of narrative and ha how to how to talk about your work in uh, in a way that that journalists are going to to want to go and tell your story and then hiring advocates that can you know help do that so you know so I, you know I think about um, you know I think about artists like Kendrick Lamar I mean Kendrick came up, I mean, that was a press-driven thing that sort of blew up and got bigger, you know, than that. But there's, you know, his last album, that, that was a, that was flat out a story and, and his life informed the telling of that story. And so, um, you know, but now he's, you know, the, probably the biggest hip hop artist there is or one of them at any rate, you know, certainly one of the most respected. So, you know, I don't know that I think that there's necessarily, um, I don't know where to place it. I mean, I don't even try to necessarily, you know, I, I don't mean it to sound so binary, you know, but, um, but you know, every artist is its own, you know, universe and, you know, we just try to like understand how to, how to, you know, how to go out and tell that story, you know? And so you have a relationship with it. You're, you're a distributor, but you have a relationship with another distributor. Well, well technically we're not a distributor. Okay, so I mean, can we're, you explain we're, the difference? We're, we're, well, you know, yeah, so Re Sony Red is our distributor, and they're fantastic, and we love them, and we've been with them since 2002. They do the, they have the warehouse and ship the product and take care of the billing and do all that stuff. And so, but, you know, sort of our relationship with them. Like they would, you know, they all, they are, you know, they love our artists, they work hard for our artists, but from a stand, from the standpoint of being able to facilitate relationships with each of them individually, that's an impossibility. They can't have, you know, you know, we, I mean, probably at any one time, you know, we're, we're between 80 and 100 active relationships with artists. They can't possibly manage that themselves. So they just deal with us, with 30 Tigers. And so we can, and, and then we manage those relationships and, and um, on the distribution side of things. But on the other hand, if an artist were to go, you know, direct with Red, I mean, the fact that we're able to collectivize, I mean, right now we're Red's number two label. And so, um, so the fact that we, I hate the word leverage, um, but the fact that we just, you know, we haven't, we do business with them all the time and they trust us and they, 
um, you know, we, we you know, work with them. We're able to be better advocates. So if an artist were just in there by themselves, they'd, I think they'd have a hard time getting the attention that we're able to, to command for them given our presence there. So as we said earlier, I have to imagine that because of the, um, the success that you have and the, the, the deal that you're able to offer in mm -hmm. which an artist can maintain control of their own master recordings and all of the yeah. other benefits that, that you provide, that there have got to be all sorts of artists that are beating down your door to, to get yeah. you to want to do business with them. So if I'm a New Orleans musician, right, and I'm not country, I'm not Americana, um, and I let you know I'm doing something that may be rootsy mm -hmm. or not, but you know it's just something kind of different. And you're here in my town, and and I would really love to get in front of you and, and get you to consider my band. What would it take to get you to actually think about you know dealing with something, I'm, or is it only stuff that, that you go out and discover on your own, or can somebody actually no. approach I mean, you and say it's pretty uh, you know it's pretty rare that the cold call kind of works for me. One, one of the reasons is, um, I mean, I, I'm trying to even think of like when that's worked uh, or when I've taken something on like that that I just didn't know anything about. I mean, generally, par part of it is, too, that I'm not just looking at the artist, although sometimes, you know, that happens. You know, I'll, I'll go to festivals, I go to Folk Alliance, I'm at Americana, I, you know, I, I, I work hard at trying to keep up and listen and, and, and keep my ears open for, you know, for amazing talent. But, you know, it really does take a village. Sturgill Simpson, without those people that were sitting up here, does not happen. And, and I don't, I, if, if you're sort of out there alone, even if you're really good, um, I, I, if you're really, really good, I can help put some of the component parts or try to help put some of the component parts together to, to would comprise your team, but without a team, you're not going to you're not going to win, and so because teams are so important that oftentimes, and, and because I'm so stretched thin, um, you know, because right now, although we just brought on a new A and R person for the last I don't know four or five months, I've been doing all the A and R for the company, and I did for the first eleven years, and then we had somebody really good in there for for a few years, and you know, she left for another position uh, elsewhere and then uh, and I've got somebody new coming in but it's just I, I c it's hard for me to to really keep up so getting a call from you know from like the John Strom who's uh, Sturgill's attorney and saying man I've got this thing you should check out or you know if a Mark DeTore you know who manages Sturgill calls me you know there's so you know there's a you know I, I you have sources that you trust yeah yeah I mean but does it at the end of the day does it boil down to that kind of experience that you talked about with Kristen where you just happen you have to see that person live and and believe in it with from what you've seen with your own eyes or is it does it ever happen that somebody actually sticks a, a, a CD in your hand and you decide on a whim to put it on in the car and you're like wow this is incredible I need this it's I, I can't think of the last time that happened you know to be honest no that's fair I mean yeah. we need I mean, to know the real deal yeah I mean uh, you know it's not an impossibility and I'm sure it's happened at some point. I just don't remember. Okay. I just don't remember it happening recently. So when people write about 30 Tigers, a lot of the times what, one of the things that they bring up is that you provide this incredible service when artists are at the beginning stage of their career. And then sometimes, as was, has just happened with Sturgill, they will sign with a major. So Sturgill mm -hmm. has signed with Atlantic. D does that feel like, well, in the, in the clip from Ray, you didn't see the movie, but what happened? What the, what the scene afterwards yeah. is his showdown with Ahmed Erdogan yeah. and, and Jerry Wexler, where he has to break it to them that yeah. he's leaving their little independent to go yeah. sign with CBS. D yeah. d how does that go down with you? Well, I mean, I don't love it, but you know, um, but you know, that's part of where you know love comes in, and and Sturgill and Mark are there's they're smart people, and I don't know the. You know, and it's not any of my business what the intimate details of their relationship with Atlantic is, but, um, but you know, I did when this came up. You know, I, I flew to San Francisco and I talked with them, and and you know, just really had a good conversation about like, okay, are you sure you want to do this? Because everything that you've done, you've done because you were at a place where you could say precisely what you wanted to say, and you had control, and you do understand you're giving up a certain amount of control, but. You know, I think in the relationship that they have with Atlantic, that they retain 
a great deal of control and probably you know more than than they would norm you know than they would normally get but you know in in or that artists get in those types of relationships because you know when you're when you're with a label even if you're in a situation where it feels benign and you've got an a and r person who's really cool and 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 all that the the uh you know uh, it there's still you're still in a situation where you know you're creating intellectual uh, intellectual property asset that belongs to them and the a and r person's job to a certain degree even th you know is to protect the qu it's a quality control of the intellectual property of the company and so it doesn't it can mesh up with your creative expression but it, it in the case of a tie you know it doesn't i, I sort of Look at the A and R process. It made I'm sort of I sort of refer to A and R people often as they're. It's like well, they're the good cop, but you're still getting arrested. You know, <laughs> so. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, if, unless anybody right, has there's any probably more judgment in that analogy than I wanted there to be. <laughs> sorry. Um, yes. Hey, David. Question is, you just lost your artist to Atlantic. How do you hold on to an artist? Do you sign a deal for multiple years? Do you, no. or it's just one off? No, well, we sign a distribution, it's distribution deal with the entity. So Sturgill created High Top Mountain mm -hmm. Records. Um, and so we contract with the label. Okay. So, uh, so that is, um, so our relationship with High Top Mountain Recordings continues though Sturgill as an artist is free to go and do what he feels is best. And, and you know, and honestly, I, you know, like I'll, I'll say like the Avett brothers, for instance, we worked with them for a long time. Rick Rubin wanted to produce them and for where they were and what they were going to put in there, that was the right decision to make. And I knew it at the time and I encouraged it, you know. So the Avett brothers and the label that they were on that their, they and their manager have together remains in the family. Mm -hmm. We sell a lot of catalog, but the Avett brothers as an act are free to go and do what they want to do. And I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm, I'm bummed when people leave, but you know, if you really want what's best for the artist, and we do, then allowing them the freedom to make you know choices that they feel are in their best interests mm -hmm. is because I, I knew that we had breakfast a couple of weeks ago and you yeah. mentioned something like this but it was interesting because if you don't have that guarantee down the road they can leave at any time and you put all your effort and everything to it i just didn't know what your you just have to have faith in, yeah, the, no. in the long run i i have faith in the long run that i'm building something that is more valuable to artists than what exists and you know, if I if I'm not, then I'll go out of business. And you know, and but you know, but th there's certain you know principles. It's kind of I don't know. I've d I have you know probably like Sturgill. I've, I've I've done you know my share of hallucinogenic. So maybe some of that some of my philosophy comes from you know too many mushrooms. Uh, uh, you know, but you know I I think a lot about sort of you know the relationship. It's like if you're if you're in an environment where people feel free, mm -hmm. then they want to come near you. If you if you create an environment where people feel constrained, uh, then they want to get away from you. And it's a certain act of faith to create an open environment. But by creating an open environment, people come near because they, they feel about, you know, me and 30 tigers that, you know, that, that, that there's, um, that, they, that pe they're, they're in a place where people really do care about them, you know, and uh, and also, you know, it, it just also in the in the sort of sales, the you know, the creating uh, or, or you know, sort of taking away impediments to a yes. You know, if you sign if you sign a deal, I was talking with a manager for uh, you know an artist who's a little bit more of a heritage artist, and they were talking about their, you know, the record deal, and and you know, the manager was like, man, well, you know, this you know, you know, this artist realizes that this is probably the last contract they'll ever sign, and they really need to make it because those contracts are generally like one plus four options. Mm -hmm. So if they're gonna do a deal, then they're gonna get locked in. And I said, well, or unless you sign with me and then you can be a free agent every single time. And you know, so if there's a, if the impediment is taken away of feeling constrained, mm -hmm. then the, it, 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 it's, it, the barrier to entry with us, it's like, oh, well, okay, well we can try that. And if it doesn't work, then we're, we can go elsewhere. So it allows me to do a lot more business, you know?
So. Two years ago at this conference, we had the manager for Macklemore and Ryan Lewis, who at the time were riding super high on, on their big hit, which was an independent release, which was why we were so interested in it. And, and he told the story about how they were being actively courted by major labels at the time, and they had the guts to stick to their guns and say, no, we're going to keep ownership of this mm -hmm. master, but we will do a licensing deal with you. Yeah. Primarily, well, number one, they wanted to retain ownership of the masters, mm -hmm. but the other thing that they really wanted was they wanted to be able to leverage the resources of a major label for the for sp strictly for yeah. their radio promotion. They wanted the ability yeah. to get a hit at radio. Well, that is one of the real, that is one of the many benefits of our relationship with Sony because we um, have done the same thing with those guys. We have a commercial country artist named Chase Rice, um, and it started blowing up and we were able to go to Columbia and work out a deal where they took a percentage of the take. It was like, look, all the risk is on us. You don't have to, you won't lose a dime. All you'll, all you'll do is make money. It'll be less than you might ordinarily make, but you know, sort of in that diversification of your investments, this will be your bond. You're in the stock business, but this will be your bond, you know? And you know, they came in and they did a great job and I, you know, the way things are going, I think it's possible that Chase Rice may be our first gold a album ever. And it was thanks in part to, well, in large part to, you know, to our relationship with Sony. And so, um, you know, those kinds of pragmatic things, but Chase owns that master. So it's a, it's very much the Macklemore so he hasn't Ryan Lewis. signed with Sony? He's not a Sony artist? Well, or? put it this way, he um, he is because they, they he is going to, uh, uh, on the next thing, much like Sturgill is going to Atlantic. I'm talking about the, right, this particular gotcha. album. Understood. So, so, but, yeah. so, but what about radio and radio promotion? Is that something that you feel is one of the tools that you need to be able to offer artists in order to be able to stay competitive? Well, we, that's why we created a country radio promotion staff. So we've just hired four people uh, under the leadership of, uh, of Pam Newman, who we've worked with for years. She's, a, I think, a very innovative uh, promotion executive, uh, I think, thinks about things in, in, in very, you know, smart ways, uh, both from, you know, the, the music that she tends to want to work with and, and all that. So we're, you know, there, and once again, there's certain types of acts that we're going to really be able to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to, you know, serve well, but, you know, we had a band old dominion and this was kind of the, the defining moment for me where, you know, we had, I mean, because we started with the Eli Young Band and they've gone on to have number one hits through the Universal System and, um, you know, Josh Abbott signed to Atlantic and, and we had Old Dominion and we, things were really starting to go and, you know, Pam had gotten them so far, but she was only one person, you know, working that record. So we, you know, so we've just made the decision, but Old Dominion, when it t came, t uh, it, it became time to s sort of broaden it to a national discussion uh, we weren't able to scale, you know, quickly enough, and they felt like they had to go to a label. And it was like, I don't blame you. I totally get it, but I don't want that to ever happen again because I don't, you know, I mean, you know, I, I don't want to be. I don't want to be a stepping stone. I want to be the destination, you know. And I'm, I'm building a destination business, so it's like if we're going to be in that business, then we need to be in that business. Right on. So once again, just let me kind of ask if you could, if, if there are aspiring artists that are, are either here in the audience or watching online and, and they have the opportunity to talk to somebody like you and they aspire to be able to get you to be interested in them and want to be able to sign the type of uh, advantageous deal that you offer, what advice would you have to an up and coming artist if, if they want to get your attention? Um. Well, I think um, sort of know what it is that you want to accomplish. You know, if you if you are um, if you're a press driven artist, have a sense of you know tell tell me what you want to say. Um, if you're um, a hit driven artist, um, that's a little more difficult for us to be able to to take on. Uh, to be honest, in the in, in the country realm, uh, you know, we're we're uh, you know, we're, we're, we have, we can control our destiny to a large degree now. Um, and, you know, we've had, you know, in, in triple, I'll say that in the triple A format, we're really strong. St. Paul had a top five triple A hit and, and all this stuff. So we're, we're really good in that world. But, um, you know, have a narrative, have a team, if as much as you can, um, uh, you know, 
please send your music to me on a SoundCloud link. Uh, I don't want to download anything. I don't want a physical CD, you know. Um, I just, you know, so, I mean, SoundCloud, I'm able to listen on my phone, and I travel all the time, so it makes it a lot easier. I'll be able to listen uh, quick, more quickly. And I try to listen to everything that comes in, or, but now with, I'll be probably passing things on to our new A&R person and letting her make a lot of the decisions. But, you know, I still, you know, I'll still do, you know, a good deal of the A&R. I just, you know, I probably never, you know, won't, so. Well, I'm afraid that's all we have time for, but I am so grateful to you, David Macias, oh. for coming and speaking at the Sync Up Conference. Thank you so Thank much you. for being here. Thanks, man. Thanks, guys. All right. Well, thank you all. And don't forget, the last day of this year's Sync Up Conference is tomorrow right here, starting at 10 a.m. So please come back, and we will see you at the Jazz Fest. Thank you.